Who has been the biggest training camp riser for the Dallas Cowboys? All that and more this episode of the Locked On Cowboys podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your Locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Locked Network, your on. team every day. Locked On. Locked On. Locked On. Locked On. Locked On. Locked On. Cowboys. Locked on. Cowboys. Welcome back to the Lockdown Cowboys podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. I am Marcus Mosher. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosher. He is Landon McCool. Check him out on Twitter at McCoolBCB. Landon, how are you doing today, sir? Doing well. Uh, excited to uh, do some more Cowboys football talk. Uh, this, things have... We're getting close to the end of Oxnard at this point, yeah. so uh, they're gonna, team's going to head up to Denver soon. We're going to see get some practices going, which are, which will be very informative. So uh, there's lots to talk about. Yeah, and just for the record, if you're watching this on YouTube, I, I'm doing something I've never done before. I'm actually wearing I'm wearing a T-shirt that has a running back on it. It's, uh, oh my gosh! Well, Not just yeah. any running back, just the well, running back. Yeah, it's Emmett Smith. So this is the first time I think I've ever worn a shirt that has a running back on it. So. Groundbreaking stuff. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, You've let's come a long some... way, baby. As, I know. As the, come as a, a long way. Uh, I was also talking about a potential off the ball linebacker being one of the greatest players uh, in defensive. What's happening here? Yeah, I, what, never mind. What is going story. on? Let's, uh, all right, let's get to uh, some unanswered training camp questions that I have for you, Lane. I've got like four or five, and the first one's really interesting because, believe it or not, there's some disagreement about this one. No. Um, Pro Football Focus had an article today on every team's biggest training camp riser, and they had Dennis Houston, the wide receiver for the Cowboys, on that list. Uh, but we've also heard some pushback from people, including Brian Broaddus, that maybe Houston hasn't been as good in camp as everybody is talking about. So would you agree that Dennis Houston is one of the biggest training camp risers? Uh, you know, I think that that would imply that, like, I think that Dennis Houston did most of his rising in the OTAs, right? He came in after a strong OTAs and 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 positioned himself going in as the uh, the wide receiver that they were bringing in to, to the first team when they went into three wide receiver sets. Since he's been in training camp, I think he's been very solid. He's made it extremely tough for them to try to rotate in guys like Noah Brown and, and Simi Fahoku into the first team because – he continues to just show up. He continues just to produce and and do what he's supposed to do. Now, I I heard reports from uh from Broadus, I think it was on 105.3 or something like that that mm -hmm. suggested that uh, he hasn't been impressive. I, I mean, I think that Noah. Look, I, I agree that I think Noah Brown and Simi Fahoku are more than likely going to be the ones that will step into the role of contributing at that position once we get close to the regular season, but it's hard to deny the fact that Houston has every single day shown up and made it difficult for the Cowboys to put those guys into the position to take that job from him. So I wouldn't say that he's, uh, you know, not done anything or, or that he's not showing out or anything. I think he's doing exactly what is required and as what's asked of him. That's why he's continued to keep that spot. I just don't know that he's flashing. I guess is the way to put it, right? He's been more of a reliable target for Dak than a guy who's going to be making big flashy plays that we're going to notice all the time in training camp. What's better to have though? Would you rather have that's, the guy that's flashy I mean, or the guy that's consistently just doing his job? I think that that's the question that they're probably asking themselves at this point, right? Is um, and, and it's not like Brown and Fahoku have been up and down either. It's just they, their uh, highs have been higher. Right, like yeah. that's probably the best way to say that, right? Yeah, for sure. And and I think again, like, I think if they had their druthers, it would be easy to just simply put Brown in as the third wide receiver, or Fahoko in as the third wide receiver, and, and let them take those reps. I think Dennis Houston is making that very difficult for the coaches right now, yeah. with very extremely consistent play, and 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 you know that's kind of demoting somebody like Dennis Houston with the way he's playing, it would not read well to the rest of the team, I guess is the best way to say Here, it. Here's why I think uh, Houston is a riser is because we did an undrafted free agent show. I think we did four shows kind of going That's through fair. the top free agent guys, and that included Ty Freifogel, Don Terrio Drummond, Peyton Hendershot. 
And we never mentioned Dennis Houston once. So he goes from somebody that we're not even really looking at at all to taking a lot of first string reps. And for me, like he might not make the 53 man roster. It might just be a squeeze and he makes the practice squad. But the fact that he's even in the conversation means he's a pretty big riser to me. Oh, I mean, I think if we're talking overall since the draft, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look like, and by the way, I would like to point out that we kind of nailed the Fry Fogel situation. That that guy has not done really anything since he's yeah. been out here. Um, but I think that, like you know, Houston has been um, you know, incredibly, incredibly consistent, and I think that's something that's been appealing. And even in a situation like we've mentioned, where the wide receivers, you know, almost to a, almost all the way, almost everybody except for Fry Fogel, has shown you a little bit of something at some point uh, during these practices. But Houston continues to be the guy that, you know, and I, I, I can't, I wasn't out there yesterday uh, and the day before, so I can't speak to those practices. But when I was out there, he was the guy who consistently was doing exactly what he was supposed to be and, and just, you know, is making it very hard yeah. for anybody to kind of take his spot on the depth chart. I don't think he's created like a ton of separation or no. making spectacular catches or anything like that. But, I think Dak just kind of trusts him a little bit in the way that he's always trusted Noah Brown a little bit, just to be in the right spot at the right time. Lots of tight window passes. He's yeah. catch. He catches it all. He's where he's supposed to be. It's it's not you know it's not busting a, a guy out, breaking a guy down in, in man coverage or uh, making a defense bust coverage because of his route. It, it's just him being where he's supposed yeah. to, and then getting catching a tough pass. Lots of can, catching a tough pass. Can I be clear, though, as well? If he doesn't make the 53-man roster, that doesn't mean that he wasn't one of the biggest risers in camp, right? Like, I think probably the most likely solution or most likely outcome here is that he gets cut. You know, the Cowboys keep six receivers. He's the number one receiver on the practice squad. So if an injury yeah. happens, he's somebody that we pull. they pull up and they feel great about him as the wide receiver four or wide receiver five. Cowboys have had players like this before. I think, I mean, Lance Lenore is probably a good yeah. comp for him, right? Like have the Lance Lenore career path without getting hurt. You could stay in the NFL for a while. Well, they have that, that don't they still have that rule where you can call up two of your practice squad players yes. every year? And then they, you don't have su- to expose them to waivers after the game. Yep. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what Houston's uh, role is for a couple. I mean, I, it's limited. I think you can only do it. Every player gets like, four or five or something like that. I would bet more at the end of the year, once kind of injuries start to happen and all that kind of stuff. I bet you that's what it's more likely to occur. Yeah, because I mean, they are having a work with special teams and stuff, so it it does make it sound like they're interested in having him have a role in the team. The question now becomes, is that role securely on the 53 or part of this kind of semi, you know, being on the practice squad, being called up sort of role? All right, we've got some more uh, burning questions that we need to get through. But before we do that, I want to tell you about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs, find all of your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games, find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information from live in-game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered head to bet online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action bet online where the game starts. All right, let's get to uh Simi Fahoku who you, you actually mentioned just a little bit ago. What can we reasonably expect for him or from him this season? Because Saw him have a nice touchdown in the red zone yesterday. I saw him have a nice uh, touchdown in one-on-one drills. So somebody the Cowboys spent a day three pick on. Is it too much to ask for him from him to, to be the number three receiver this season? Um, I think it, it might be too much to ask of him to, to do that for the entire season, right? Um, I think he's a very solid, very good number four wide receiver. Is he a lot uh, to make the roster, in your opinion? I don't know how you cut him. Like yeah. after the I've... after the pre off season he's had, in the in the in the training camp he's had, like, uh, yeah, I, I I'd say he's done every bit as much as as Noah Brown almost, um, and I'm certainly not cutting Noah Brown. So I, I yeah. wonder, Landon, if the Cowboys are going to have less set number one, number two, number three receivers yeah, than I we're do. used to seeing. Right, where more is going to be. 
CD Lamb's your one. This isn't like a 2018 thing where we're gonna have rotating number ones between Deontay Thompson and Alan Hearns, but you've got CD Lamb as your one, Michael Gallup as your two, and depending on the matchup and the defense, your number yeah. three and number four receivers might be different, right? If you need a little bit more size and speed, maybe it's Fahoku. If you need somebody that's a little slippier, slippier and they can get down the field in the seam, maybe it's Jalen Tolber. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what we see. No, not at all, especially since this – I mean, we've talked about it. This uh, offensive coordinator wants to formation you to death. He wants yeah. to deploy a bunch of different personnel groups. And, and look, again, I, I think it's part of the reason why they wanted to kind of uh, give themselves more freedom with their wide receivers. They they felt – they probably felt pigeon-held to, to, to kind of uh, have to have Cooper uh, uh, and Lamb and uh, – and gallop all on the field at, at, at one time and, 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 you know, to do that as often as possible. And that kind of goes in, uh, in conflict with how this offensive coordinator kind of wants to call plays at times. He wants to be able to use multiple different personnel groups. He doesn't want to have to feel obligated to have to put X player on the field all the time. So I think this kind of freedom in the down roster wide receiver room, uh, you know, allows them the ability to, feel good about, you know, okay, we're going to put out a, a 12 personnel, but instead of uh, Tolbert out there, we're going to put Noah Brown. Yeah. And and we, we've got a little bit, now we feel we got a little bit more of a solid blocker if we want to run a call or run play, you know, and they and they can deploy these groups based on the kind of plays they want to run. So I, I do think that, you know, we've talked about in the past that you kind of want to have a wide receiver room that has, uh, uh, you know, a variety of different skill sets. You want it to look like a basketball starting lineup, right? Yep. Where everybody and, and, can do a little bit of different things. Or like an old, I mean, that's how old the saying is, like an old basketball like lineup. A, yeah, like an like, 80s yeah. or 90s basketball yeah. team, right? Yeah, not like a modern one. But but uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, the idea is that you want to have a, a group of guys that have kind of different skill sets so that you can do different things. Um, and I think that that's what you are looking at with a situation down roster with the Noah Browns, the semi Fahokus. Mm-hmm. I mean, Turpins obviously falls into that category as being a very different type of player. So, um, you know, I, I think that there is more scheme versatility in having more versatile type players that you're uh, comfortable rotating in on specific formations, sp- sp- specific packages in order to kind of uh, avail yourselves of their skill set. Yeah, uh, we call that the lucky whitehead package that Turpin is <laughs> going to be using or going to be yeah. in. But I think he's going to make the roster just because he's the only guy that could probably run the jet sweeps and the end arounds and the special team stuff. I think he's a, a lot to make the roster. Uh, all right, next question. This one I know is tricky because what they do on the field does not necessarily reflect their actual job. But who will be the number two quarterback for the Cowboys this year? Will it be Cooper Rush, who was you know held that job last year? Or is it going to be Will Greer? It's, it's a really good question. I mean, I think it's it's early. You know, we, we really do need these practices and this training camp, uh, these uh, preseason games to kind of help determine that a little bit more. I kind of think that Will Greer has a chance. You know, like he's looked really good out here. He's he's made plays. Um, you know, he's he's. Will it matter? I mean, th- this is another question though. Like. Yeah, Mike McCarthy likes to keep three quarterbacks, right? So sure. I don't know if it matters too, too much. I, I, I think it almost would depend on the game. Like if Dak goes down for a game, part of me still wonders if Cooper Rush would be the guy. But if he goes down for a four-game stretch, maybe that's when they play Will Greer. That's why I tend to think that they're going to cut one of these guys and try to sneak them onto the practice squad. Um, I, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was Cooper Rush because I don't know that you know the rest of the league – views Cooper Rush the way that the Cowboys do because part of what makes him valuable to the Cowboys is that he understands our offense really well. So I think he's a guy that you could cut and sneak to the practice squad, hold on to, and then you can kind of figure out exactly how you want to distribute those, you know, snaps if something were to happen to Dak short or long term, right? Um, but I, I think the the point is is that Greer has shown you enough in training camp so far, I mean, again, this is still very early and, and we need all these, we need all these preseason games and practices to know, but I think Greer has shown you enough that it's at least intriguing on his upside at the position. It's a competition in a way. now, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think, honestly, I didn't think going into camp that it was going to be a competition. This felt like such a lock that Rush was going to have the job. And now we see maybe, it, it, and maybe we see Will Greer start one of these games. Cause I don't, 
I don't think Dak's going to play in the preseason. There's just no, no reason to. No, no, so no, no, maybe, no. maybe we see Will Greer for the whole first half of like the third preseason game just to see what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the difference too between him and like Gilbert is that I think that there's more upside here with Greer. You know, he's still a young player. He has some skills, and I think that there's stuff to develop there. Uh, and and to me, the question last year was, okay, you know, maybe Gilbert doesn't have upside, but he has some variance to his game, right? That maybe Gary that, Gilbert, you know, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, that 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 like you could say maybe that's what you want over Cooper Rush, and ultimately they decided over Cooper Rush. I think this year they look at the situation at, you know, and they see Will Greer and Greer is like Gilbert in the sense that he probably has more variance to his game, but there's also upside to develop and to yep. become a, a, a good quarterback. He obviously has a high pedigree coming out of college at West Virginia, put up in just absolutely insane numbers. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the, the angles have changed a little bit, but they've also changed for Cooper Rush because Cooper Rush has proven that he can go into a game and win a football game on the road against a, a not easy, necessarily easy opponent. So uh, I think it is more of a competition. Uh, and I also think that you, you, you feel better about w- whatever the situation is, right? I feel better. If Cooper Rush wins the, the job, great. I feel good about Cooper Rush just based on previous – Yep. stuff and what we've seen if Greer wins the job great he beat out a guy that I felt comfortable with and maybe mm-hmm. there's some upside there I think the situation no matter what the outcome we're gonna feel better about it than we did maybe this time last year you know what's nice is we're not talking about Ben DiNucci being the third quarterback or Ben DiNucci ruining practices because you've got Cooper Rush and Will Greer who have been having nice training camps so he's he makes nice hats that's uh that's about it all right, one more question, uh, Landon, and this is maybe the most important of the four questions oh, I'm going to ask you. Has Micah Parsons taken a leap in your eyes in training camp? Because <laughs> there, this team is so going to be, I think early on in the season especially, is going to be reliant on their defense to win them games or at least keep k- games close. For them to kind of take that next step as a defense, I think they need Parsons to be like a generational defender. Have yeah. you seen that happening so far in camp? I want to give a quick shout out to Vach Lombardi. Right? I, I was actually watching his show last night. He's out there down there at camp right now uh, doing a great job. You guys make sure you check him out too if you get a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he said something that really kind of rung true with me. Let me see if I can get this right. Uh, I, I'm not going to get the phrasing correctly, right? so I apologize. But it's something to the extent of don't sleep on greatness. Right. Like don't don't get lulled to sleep by greatness. I I think that's what's happening to a large degree with Parsons is that there are so many times that like we're in team reps or 11 on 11s and Parsons obviously ruins the whole rep. (laughs) Like it's like he destroys the whole rep within the first, you know, less than two seconds of the snap. Right. And you know, the offense and the rest of the team, they just have to keep going because they need to get the rep done. If, if, if they reset every single time Parsons ruined a snap, they yes. would never get any practice done. So, and I think it's, it's because of this, okay, Parsons got there, but we're still going. Oh, look, Dak threw a touchdown. You know, it's we're like, kind of numb to it, right? Like yeah, in exactly. the same way that Cowboy fans have been numb to like Zach Martin, just going out and dominating every game. Like, if Zach Martin just – you put him on another team for one practice, that's all anybody would talk about, right? But because we've seen it for so many years with Zach Martin and now back-to-back training camps with Parsons, it's just – it's not new and exciting anymore, but it should be. And it's – and it's and, Ter- and that's the other thing. Like, and the other side of that is like Terrence Steele, I think, is having a really good camp. But it, it, it sure wouldn't be able to tell if you went against Micah Parsons all day because Parsons is killing him. And I, I – to answer your question, uh, yes, he, he looks somehow faster, somehow stronger than he did last year. He looks definitely more confident and knows what he's doing, but it's easy to just overlook it because everyone there is so used to him just being that guy that they kind of have to just work around him in practice in order to not, not let him ruin practice for the offense. It's, 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 it's really weird. Do you know how I know that's the case? So John Machado yesterday posted a a video of Micah Parsons. It was in team drills going up against Terrence Steele where he ran around him and got the sack on deck. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you saw this play, right? Yeah. 
I actually looked at that tweet this morning and it had 11 retweets, whatever, right? It caught a couple bigger name people, including Charles McDonald, uh, who, who saw it from Underdog Fantasy. And it blew up because it was like Cowboy fans are so used to seeing this. It's just not a big deal. This happens every day in practice. But when other people that don't cover yeah. the Cowboys see it, they're like, oh, my gosh, did you see that? And actually, Charles compared it. It's like you put Von Miller and Brian Erlacher into the same body, and he's rushing the passer on the outside. It's pretty freaky stuff going on, Landon. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, dude could run underneath a table without, without losing any speed, without a doubt. Like, I mean, he's just – the level of flexibility and, and – you know, well, and that's I mean, what look, they pointed out is he's bending around the corner, yeah, and accelerating, which accelerating. I've never seen before. Yeah, it's 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 freaky. I mean, I, 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 we keep saying that, but it's like it's it's it freaky. Uh, you know, describes the athleticism, but watching it is uncanny because you're like, how is he actually shifting his momentum around the corner while bending over and like moving so fast in one direction that a prof- another professional athlete can barely react to him. It's like, yeah, I mean, there's things like that that he does that are, you know, we throw around the term unblockable, but I mean, like, like you really can't block something you can't touch. And if he's so fast that he's at your back hip and around the corner before you can get your hands to him. And even if you could get to your hands, I mean, that's, that's really the problem that steel and everyone is having is that, it's so fast that it's happening. And even if when it's not so fast, he's so low, he's, he's playing so low that it's hard for the, for the tackle to even get his hands on him uh, to even redirect him a little bit. So to answer your question, uh, yeah, Michael Morris is going to be very good this year. Uh, not surprising. I, I keep looking, I mean, this is a sidetrack, but I keep looking at Ryan Jensen being out and then they had, you know, another little scare with the bucks had another little scare with their center. Robert and Hainsey, I'm just sitting yep. there. I'm just yep. sitting there going, Tom Brady has got to be terrified about that interior offensive line going against Micah Parsons and, and what he can do. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think it, you know, there's a lot of great stuff happening at camp on the defensive side of the football. Uh, and, and I think that most of that is happening without also conceiving of all the crazy stuff that Micah Parsons is doing yeah. that is basically just being ignored so that we can facilitate the rest of practice. Yeah. And I think part of it too, is like when Parsons isn't technically sacking the quarterback or bringing him down and he's just bending off the edge and touching his shoulder, it doesn't look as cool as it would in a game, right? Like that's all we would talk about in a game, but in practice you think, Oh, well maybe Dak could have slid out of that one. Or maybe, maybe he would have stepped up and got rid of the ball. It's not happening, no. man. It's, no. That's why it's, it's going to be kind of incredible once we get to the season. And remember Micah Parsons was practicing mostly as an off the ball linebacker at this time last year. It wasn't until week two that they were forced to play him on the edge. Pretty amazing. It, it's hard to put into words um, the natural talent. I mean, look, last year, people that know pass rushing, like John Owning and, and these folks that like have stu- that study this almost exclusively, you know, basically gave Parsons very little chance uh, to, to be kind of an elite pass rusher because it's so difficult. It's like, it's such a you need rare years trait. and years and years of doing this. Right. And, and, and the idea of someone who hasn't passed, rushed the passer, like, you know, like rush the passer exclusively it since high school, the idea of him coming into the NFL and having an effect as a rookie, where even the best pass rushers coming out of college well, struggle to, to adjust to coming into the NFL. The fact I, that I would this guy Anthony bar like Anthony yeah. bar is somebody who, Similar build, 6'4", 255, long arms, great athlete. Just never got it, right? Like, he's a good blitzer, but he's not a yeah. great pass rusher. So I think a lot of people are thinking the same thing. You know, Barr's a high first-round pick. Parsons a high first-round pick. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to turn into that player. Oh, beyond that, it's it's oh, it's almost unrealistic. It's it yeah. is unrealistic. It is to unrealistic. expect anybody to to do this. We've what never Parsons seen this did. before. We've yeah, never it's... ever seen this before, where somebody goes from a pure off the ball linebacker in college to a potential All Pro edge rusher in the NFL. It just it just doesn't happen. A, a guy that you know w- was considered as maybe you know, maybe an occasional pass rusher is on a per pass rush basis, the most dominant pass rusher in the NFL. 
that that's rare, rare. <laughs> like that just doesn't happen yeah that's pretty rare uh all right that is it for today's show thank you for making locked on cowboys your first listen today now make locked on fantasy football your second listen find the intellectual fantasy expert Vinny Iyer, who brings over 20 years of nfl expertise in a unique angle to give you the moves no one else has get ready for your fantasy draft with locked on fantasy football you can download the Lockdown Cowboys podcast wherever you get podcasts. Check us out over on YouTube as well. You can follow the show at Lockdown Cowboys. You can follow Landon at McCoolBCB. And I'm at Marcus underscore Mosier. And we'll see you next time.